little portion of God's word. I want to let you know that if you're visiting with us, you are indeed our honored guest, and we're thankful uh, for you being with us. Tonight, I want us to talk just for a few minutes on the need for wholesome speech. And when I was talking to our dear brother, Brother Eric, and also Brother Kenny, concerning some of the lessons, uh, this was one of them that I wanted to uh, work with, and the reason why is because our speech is important, and what we say is important. Now, I'm not going to get in all of the particulars on how we say it, and the reason why is because that's subjective. But what we say is important, and what we don't say is important. And so there are many things in this life that we need. We need salvation. We need the forgiveness of sins. We need the church of Christ. We need God and his word. We need sound minds. We, we need those things. But we really need wholesome speech. And when you think about wholesome speech, I'll give you a couple of working definitions. And when I give definitions, I give definitions from the original language. And I like to get the definitions that I know that the Bible supports. And so I'm not going to give you what I think what the definitions ought to be. But in the Hebrew, when you think of the idea of wholesome, it's the idea of good health, physical well-being, good for one, very beneficial, strengthening and sustaining. I like this definition, uncontaminated. When something is wholesome, it is uncontaminated. We find this particular idea in the book of Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 4. But let's read Proverbs 15, 1 through 4, and then we'll continue with some introductory remarks. Here the Bible says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pour forth foolishness, silliness, folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place keeping watch on the evil and the good. Now watch this. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Did you see that? A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Think about that tree of life aspect. When you consider even our speech, our speech ought to emulate the tree of life, that which is wholesome, that which brings forth life, that which is beneficial, that which is strengthening. That which is uncontaminated. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 3, here we see the same idea yet in the New Testament. When I'm studying, I'm always going back to the Old Testament. And the reason why is because the things that are written aforetime were written for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Here we find Paul telling Timothy, if anyone, it doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter their pedigree, doesn't matter who they are. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not watch this, consent to wholesome words. The idea of wholesome words there is the idea of sound, healthy, beneficial. I love this definition, safe and sound. If a person does not consent to wholesome words, even our words or the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud knowing nothing. He goes on and on and on. And so when you think about wholesome words, we're talking about words that benefit, words that bring forth life, words that help people. I was talking to my wife a few minutes ago and we were talking about this lesson and she said something that was very interesting. She said, you can tell a lot about a person's words depending on their diet. What diet? Their spiritual diet. If they're not reading the word of God, it will come out in their speech. If they're reading the word of God, it will come out in their speech. And you remember on one occasion, it was the disciples. And remember, it was Peter, James, and John. And they knew that they had been with Jesus because of their speech. Because of their words. And so when we think of 2 Timothy 1 and verse number 13, turn there real quick. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse number 13, Paul tells Timothy in the second letter, hold fast, cling, notice, cling fast the patterns of sound words which you have heard from me. And then he goes on and on. 
Brethren, when we stop and we think about sound words, healthy words, we're talking about words that are profitable, words that are healing, words that help one another. I want us to consider, number one, our speech. I only got two points, and that's not unscriptural. That's not unscriptural, you know. We got three points in this. I got only two points, and they're long enough for all of us. <laughs> but the first point, our speech should be wise for evangelism. Now, remember, Proverbs 15 and verse number four, as it relates to our words being wholesome, is a tree of life. A tree of life. And remember the tree of life in the garden, and they lost the tree of life. And remember Jesus, when he came, he died on the tree, and that was a tree of life. And we know in Revelation 22 that the tree of life is in heaven. From tree to tree to tree, our message ought to be words that actually uh, help people to see the tree of life. Look at Colossians 4, verses 4 through 6. In Colossians 4, and verses 4 through 6, our words ought to be life. But those words must be seasoned with some things. The whole context of uh, Colossians chapter 4, especially verses 2 through 6, is dealing with evangelism, if you will. And that's just another way of saying that we ought to be able to influence those who are on the outside. But notice verse number 5. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Why? In order that you may know how you ought to answer each one. How do I know how to answer people unless I go to the word of God? If I take advantage of the opportunities that God has given me, the open doors, and we ought to be praying for those open doors. When we pray for those open doors, we need to go in there and make sure that the words that we are using are words of life. Amen. Words of life. Which means that I'm not talking to people and coming to them with my opinions. Brethren, even when we come together on the first day of the week, when we come together during a gospel meeting, a lectureship, it doesn't matter. People don't assemble to hear opinion. They don't assemble to hear commentary. They assemble to hear the word of God, and that's what we ought to give them. Amen. And when we're talking to people, whether it's publicly or privately, we ought to be giving them the word of God. Why? Because it is a tree of life. Yes, Proverbs chapter 11 and verse number 13. 30. Now watch this one. Go to Proverbs 11 and verse number 30. There the Bible teaches us the fruit of righteousness is a what? Tree of life. And he that wins souls is wise. I think y'all know where we're going today. At least the first part of this because the first part is the easy part. The second part you're going to have to put your seatbelt on because you're going to feel some turbulence. You, and when we stop and we think about this, we want to be people who use the word of God sharply. Cleanly. We want to make sure that the words that we use are words that the word of God are depicting. The word that the word of God will use. And so when we think about this, friends, look at Ecclesiastes 12 and verse number 10. Solomon, the preacher, the wise one. I love this verse. I was thinking about this verse today as I was meditating. And in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse number 10, here is the wisest man that ever lived besides Jesus Christ had something to say about wise words. About wise words. Let's start at verse number 9. He says, and moreover, because the preacher was what? Wise. He still taught the people knowledge. Yes. He pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find what? Acceptable words. Brethren, we don't have a right to say what we want to. Amen. <laughs> you know, I don't know about uh, here, but I got your cousins in San Angelo. And uh, I tell you, your cousins, sometimes they think they can just say what they want to because they're of age. No, if anything, you should have been exercising yourself in righteousness, and you ought to be able to say the right words at the right time. One thing I love about Jesus, Jesus said the right word at the right time. Well, he was Jesus. Now he exercised himself in righteousness. We don't have a right to say what we want to say when we want to say it. Brethren, we need to be people who understand that the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. Here we find Solomon, and he's looking for acceptable words. Why are you looking for acceptable words? Because they're words of truth. There it is right there. They're words of truth. Look at Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 13. I'll be right where you want me to be in a minute. But in Zechariah 1 and verse number 13, we find it interesting that Zechariah, a prophet, 
And as I was sitting down, I was looking at this uh, chart up here. I love that chart. That's a beautiful chart. You ought to take a picture of that chart and study that chart. Why? I had an older preacher tell me one time, if you can get the timeline down, you'll understand the Old Testament. But you got to get that timeline down. Oh, y'all need to put that in your mind. Put that in your mind. Zechariah says, and the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good and comfortable words. If the Lord uses comfortable words, shouldn't we use comfortable words? But it's not the same comfortable words that we think you know, making people feel good in their sin. That's not the comfortable Amen. words that he's talking about. He's talking about words that bring forth life. Amen. And sometimes you got to tell people what they need to hear in order to bring forth life in them. Amen. Oh, come on now. I'm trying to help y'all out. Y'all thought this was going to be some pansy preaching. Them. No, no, no. I just have to set you up. I set you up. Now I got you where I want you. Now look at James chapter 3. <laughs> In James chapter 3, brethren, there are two types of wisdom. There's only two. When I'm talking to people, especially those who are highly educated and they think they, they can outsmart you, the only thing you need is the word of God. You can't outsmart the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God, I tell you, you can have someone, they can have three PhDs and sit there and you'll run circles around them with the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians Amen. chapter 1 and 2. In James chapter 3, there's only two types of wisdom. When people get the smart and all talking crazy and saying, well, you know, we need to use a little wisdom. I always, always ask one question, preacher. I ask one question and one question on it. Which one? Y'all get that? Because there's only two wisdoms. Oh, y'all are looking at me funny. Let me prove it. In James chapter 3, starting at verse number 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct. That's the context. Let him show by good conduct that his work are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. Watch this. This wisdom does not descend from above, doesn't come from God, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Look at verse 16. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Now stop and think about that for a minute. If there are ever any of those things around you or among people that you are with in a conversation that you are engaged with, you already know this is not of God. Amen. And you need to watch your speech. You need to watch your words. At times, you need to be like Jesus and just right in the dirt. Why? Because this conversation is going nowhere fast. you got to be able to think through some things. And brethren, when you think about evangelism, it's the same way. I've learned to let people hang themselves. Oh, so, and so when they start asking questions and, and say, Brother Mike, what do you think about that? Well, here's the, here's the question I have. You're the one that brought the situation up. What you think about it? And now after you tell me what you think about it, now I can tell you what God thinks about it because I don't have no thoughts about it. Amen. And so here, there's that type of wisdom. But look at verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, watch this, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace and those by those who make peace. There are only two types of wisdom, friends. And when we think about going out seeking and saving the lost, we need to remember that there are only two types of wisdom. And the wisdom that God wants us to utilize is the wisdom that we just read about from 17 and 18. And so here's the question. When we're going out, we're seeking and saving the lost. We're talking to people about wisdom, about life, about the tree of life. How, what wisdom are we using? Brethren, I know for a fact, because I've been at this long enough, I know for a fact that people love using their own wisdom. And that's unfortunate when you're talking about spiritual things. Jeremiah said, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walked to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. The steps of a good man, we talked about this earlier, are ordered by the Lord. There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the ways of what? Yeah. Death. Brethren, we have to choose our words wisely. Well, what words should I choose? I need to be choosing spiritual words. 
And so I need to be focusing on doing what God would have me to do as it relates to evangelism, as it relates to winning souls. And if I'm going to win souls, I must be wise. Put in your notes, don't have time to deal with this. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Because in that context, we should be focusing on planting and watering and stay out of God's business of giving the increase. Amen. Stay out of God's business. You know, there was one time I was talking to my dad. And uh, he said something that's interesting. He said, I see why some people get whipped metaphorically by God because they're getting in the way of the belt. <laughs> you better get out of the way when God gets to swing in that figure the belt around. You better get out of the way. And so what you do is you teach people the word of God and you step back and you allow them to do what they're going to do with it. And so Jesus commands his disciples, go. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 7 says, as you go. Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20, he said, go preach the gospel. Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. Brethren, what are we saying? We need, to, we need to be making sure that we're preaching the word and we're making sure that we're doing what God will have us to do. That's our command. And we talked about that a little bit on yesterday. And so what business are we in? Look at 2 Corinthians 5. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 and 11, here Paul says by inspiration as he's talking to the church at Corinth. He said, for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an answer to the things that we have done in this body, whether it be good or bad. Verse number 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we do what? Persuade men. The Greek word there is the Greek word pytho. P-E-I-T-H-O, very important word. And the reason why that's an important word, Brother Eric, is because it is a cognitive of the word pistis, which we get the English word faith. And so when you think about faith, faith is credence. It is the ability to learn. And so when you think about pytho, persuasion, it is the ability to reason and draw one. Hmm. When I'm using the right words, when I'm talking to my brother in Christ or someone out in the world, I need to be developing faith through persuasion. Now think about this, friends. In Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 17, Paul was ready to go preach the gospel. He said, I'm ready to come. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm ready. Paul, what was you going to do? I'm going to preach the gospel so I can persuade them to come to Christ. Talking to a good brother yesterday, day before yesterday, and he said something that was very interesting. He said, It's not our responsibility to browbeat people into Christ. It's not our responsibility, nor should we be tricking people into Christ. We must be persuading them. Now, let me help out elders in the church. I think I said this yesterday. If not, I'm going to say it again now. Hebrews 13. Look at Hebrews 13 verse 17. In Hebrews 13 verse 17. Same word. Obey. Same word. Obey those that have the what over you? Rule. The word obey there is the Greek word pipe. The idea there is, is that it is through the influence that the elder has in his lifestyle and teaching that he persuades men and women in Christ to follow him as he follows Christ. You ain't making nobody, that's bad English in Texas, but it's good understanding in Tennessee. You ain't making nobody follow the Lord. You can persuade them, and you persuade them by you doing what's right. You persuade them through the preaching, through the teaching, through the lifestyle. And no wonder Jesus has so many followers. Why? Because he was persuading people to follow him through his teaching and lifestyle. And so children follow their parents because of persuasion. And that persuasion is the idea of reasoning, the idea of instruction, the idea of discipline, the idea of showing. That's good preaching right there. That's good preaching, brother. I'm not trying to be angry. That's good preaching right there. And the reason why that's good preaching, brother, because we need more elders that realize that this is not a corporate America business. This is the Church of Christ. Amen. Church of Christ. I can't make you follow God. God doesn't even do that. Whosoever will, let him come and drink of the waters freely. God ain't making nobody. You don't want to serve him? Fine, don't serve. But you'll pay for it in the end. Amen. Enjoy your life. And so we persuade through what? We persuade through the word of God. 
In Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. I don't have time to really deal with that, but it's in my notes, so I gotta give it to you. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The word of God will work if we trust it, if we believe in it. And that was the problem with the children of Israel and why they didn't go into the promised land. Right? This has everything to do with evangelism. If we don't believe that baptism is essential for salvation, if we don't believe that there's only one church, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, if we don't believe that marriage is one man, one woman for life, if we don't believe that, we won't go teach it. But if we believe it, nobody will stop us from saying it. Amen. And so we're here to persuade. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? It converts the soul. Let me give you a little point, Eric, to my preachers in here. This is just a little point right here. Y'all remember in Luke <coughs> chapter uh, 16, you had the rich man and Lazarus. Remember that? And it was the rich man, he was still selfish, and he wanted Lazarus to go and tell, tell my brethren that they don't want to come here, in essence. And Moses, Abraham, I'm sorry, responds to the rich man. He says, they got what? Moses and the prophets. <laughs> Hold on, what answer is that? The law of the Lord, Moses and the prophet converts the soul. They'll tell him. <laughs> I don't have to say Lazarus. They got the word of God. I tell you, man, the word of God is powerful, but we got to believe it. And the problem is this many Christians don't believe the word of God. Right. And so we got to use the word of God to persuade. We must seek the right method of persuasion. We must know that the word of God is the only means of persuasion. But Brother Mike, you just said our lifestyle. Well, if my lifestyle is based upon the word of God, then it's the word of God that's doing the persuasion through me. Amen. Good. <laughs> I tell you, I get happy, boy. I tell you, you start thinking about these things, it starts making sense. Amen. It just makes sense. And so you turn around after someone obeys the gospel, someone's life gets better, and they say, man, if it wasn't for you, I don't know where I've been. Man, stop looking at me. Look to Jesus and the author and finisher, finisher of your faith. Amen. We give God the glory. Could that be that that's the problem with most people? They want to take the glory that belongs to God. In Acts 13, verse 43, the word of God, persuasion, is used to uh, admonish one another, encourage one another to remain in the grace of God. It, it's not enough to go out and seek and save the lost. Brethren, we have to keep each other encouraged. And keeping in each other encouraged requires admonishment. The word admonishment, my brother, means instruction with warning. The Bible, the word of God, admonishes. When we sing, Colossians 3 and verse number 16, we sing and we admonish one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. That's why we have to be careful that we're not singing a lot. Because a lie singing is not admonishing at all. As a matter of fact, you can't admonish, which is instruction with warning from a biblical perspective, if the song is a lie. Jesus is coming soon. That's a lie. We don't know that. Right, y'all do what y'all want to with that. It's still right. <laughs> so here we understand, Brendan, that we ought to be encouraging one another, building one another up in the most holy faith. And no wonder we use the word of God. No wonder we reprove, rebuke, and exhort. No wonder we help one another by stirring up one another unto love and good works. No wonder we uh, speak the truth in love. No wonder we speak truth to our neighbor, Ephesians 4.25. Well, when we think about our speech, notice this point. Our speech should demonstrate the fear of the Lord. Is our speech important? I believe it is. Why? Because life is associated with it. Life is connected to it. But what else is connected to our speech? The fear of the Lord. Why do men sin? Let me tell you. Let me teach you why men sin. Look at Psalm 36, verse number 1. Psalm 36 and verse number 1. Brother Kenny, when you get Psalm 36, verse number 1, can you read that, please? <laughs> Psalm 36 and verse number 1. Why do men sin? We need to realize that we need to make sure that God is glorified and that the fear of the Lord is in our hearts. 
In Psalm 36 and verse number 1, what does the Bible say? The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. So why do men sin? There's no fear of God in their eyes. You know, there was a time where children were afraid of their parents. But that's no longer the case. You know, if your children have a healthy fear. Amen. I said healthy fear. Because healthy fear is balanced. Healthy fear is the idea of reverence and timidity together. You can't have a good cake. I know I'm not eating no sugar, no sugar sister, but I saw you making those cakes there, and I saw those cakes coming out of that pan. I'm like, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get out of here. I know I got sugar in it, right? But you got to have a little sugar. You got to have some flour. You got to have some color. You got to have all that, and you put it all together. Man, we're not saying your children need to be so afraid of you that they don't want to be around you, but they need to be afraid of you because they reverence you. Amen. And why do people sin? They don't think God don't do anything. And so what has the devil done through people? God doesn't exist. And so since God doesn't exist, there's no standard. And since there's no standard, there's no fear of the Lord. And if there's no fear of the Lord, I can do what I want to. And that's false. And so because of that, the fear of the Lord is the goal for evangelism. Brethren, did you get that? The fear of the Lord is the, is the, is the goal for evangelism. Why? Why? And there are a slew of passages that talk about the fear of the Lord. But I'm just going to give you a few. In Job 28, 28, the fear of the Lord is because of wisdom. Y'all just write these down. I don't have time to stop. In Proverbs 8 and verse number 13, because it teaches one to hate evil, pride, and arrogance. Brethren, you need the fear of the Lord. We live in a time and have always lived in a time, but especially now, people don't fear God. They don't hate evil. They're very prideful and arrogant. And it's amazing that the Holy Spirit, through Solomon, says pride and arrogance because there's a distinction between the two. <laughs> one can be prideful and arrogant. One can just be prideful. One can just be arrogant. There's a distinction. In Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. And so we can go on and on and on. We can go on and on. Point, point number two. When we think about wholesome speech and the need for it, why do we need wholesome speech? Put your seatbelts on. It's going to get a little tough. Because our speech should be wise in correcting one another. In Proverbs 9, and I'm just going to talk to you so y'all don't think I'm mad. <laughs> yeah. I'm mad at you. I ain't got time to be mad at you. Proverbs 9, verse number 7 through 9. I actually, as a father, kept these passages in front of my children all the time. Because God is my witness. And the reason why is because I wanted them to know at all times who they were. Not who I was, who they were. Watch this. <clears throat> he who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself. And he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hates you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. I used to always ask my children, are you mad at me? Do you hate me right now? Yeah, yeah. Look at Proverbs 9. Read verse 8. Am I telling you what's right? Yeah, but I don't like it. Is it right? Yes or no? And we taught our children. Brethren, if you don't get nothing else from this lesson, get this point. We taught our children, I don't care how someone tells you something. If it's true, you need to listen. Amen. Because that could save your life. Amen. That could save your life. And so now when people say things, and my children are grown, 21 to 30, and sometimes things are said to them, and it's not in a nice way, and I'll still ask, was it the right thing? Yeah. And that's why I listened to what they had to say, even though I didn't like it. My daughter, as God is my witness, says she had to go check one of her uh, fellow uh, employees because, you know, the way that she said it. 
And in that case, she was wrong. But at least she listened. We get so caught up in our feelings. And we don't even get the message. I ain't like the way he said it. He didn't say it like that. We ain't coming back. He, he just mean. Was he telling you the truth? Yay or nay? Well, yeah. Okay. Well, the Bible says speak the truth in love. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. It said speak. It said truth. It said love. Sometimes we get caught up in how people say things. Could we say things better? Maybe we could. I tell you, man, if y'all live with my wife, <laughs> sometimes be like, girl, why did you say that like that? Did you get the point? Yeah, I got the point, but good night. You're working me over. Now, that's my wife now. But you know what I learned? I learned to grow a little thick skin. You know what we have today? A bunch of people without thick skin. Amen. And most of them are men. Yes. Put your seatbelt on. Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, 26. Joshua uses his speech to rebuke Achan to his face. Brethren, our speech must be wholesome. Now, how is this wholesome? It was wholesome because Achan had to draw sin out of the congregation. Sin was in the camp, and therefore sin needed to come out. And so he falls on his face. He rents his clothes, and God tells him, get up. There's sin in the camp. Go deal with it. And we know, look at Ecclesiastes 8 and verse number 11 real quick. Brethren, if we don't deal with sin in our lives quickly, if we don't deal with sin in the lives of one another quickly, and we have to keep in mind that we're not the only one, we're not the one that's always doing the rebuking, sometimes we need to be rebuked. Amen. Sometimes we need to be reproved. We need to be corrected. I'm not always right. We live in a time where people think just because they think it, it must be right. Well, it's on the internet. it got to be true. No, it's not. If it's in the word of God, then it's right. Yeah. In Ecclesiastes 8 and verse number 11, here the Bible says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. You see that? Yeah. When you don't deal with sin quickly, it will take over a little leaven, leaven the whole yeah. lump. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. With the man that had his father's wife, Paul told him to put him away. Remove the sin. And the reason why, go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want you to look at the reason why Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells them, this man got to go. He, he has to go. Why? Because he's hurting the whole congregation. He's causing the congregation not to be as strong as it needs to be spiritually speaking. And so notice in verse number 6. He says, your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven. Why? In order that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. Why did he want them to purge out the old? So they could be the new. You know what we do sometimes? We allow sin to linger. I got a point in here. One thing about sin, it doesn't go away by itself. Amen. <laughs> it just don't leave it. It just doesn't go away until you do something about it. Wholesome speech says, brother, I, I don't really want to have to say this, but you got to deal with the adultery that's in your life. you got to deal with the immodesty that's in you. You have to deal with these things because if you don't deal with them, then you're going to have some problems. Galatians 2, 11 through 14. Paul rebuked Peter to his face. Why? Because he was the blame. He was causing dissension and division in the church. When his brethren from James came, the Jews came, he went AWOL on the Gentile brethren. Paul did not pull him to the side. Why? Because he did this publicly. And so we see that some sins, when done publicly, must be dealt with publicly. Sins that are dealt with, sins that are committed privately must be dealt with privately. And if you want to bring that public, that's upon you. However, Paul knew that if I don't deal with this situation with Peter, who is an apostle, 
a leader in the church, if I don't deal with this, then this could corrupt the whole congregation. Brethren, we have to be thinking like that. And so our speech, again, what does this have to do with our speech? Because if we want the church to live, just because we have 100 members, 400 members, uh, 200 members, doesn't mean that the congregation is alive. The congregation is alive when the congregation is doing the will of God. The congregation is alive when Jesus can actually have fellowship with the congregation and not remove the candlestick. That's when you know the congregation is alive. The congregation is alive when you know that the preaching of the gospel is actually being preached, but not just that, but living the gospel as well. The congregation is alive. And when the congregation is dead, the candlestick is removed and the people do whatever they want because they cast off restraint. Brethren, and when we think about withdrawal of fellowship in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 5 through, uh, verse 6 through 7, we see that they actually withdrew from him. And the idea of withdrawal is a better uh, terminology than disfellowship because what did they do? They withdrew their fellowship. He wasn't going to stop fellowshipping. He wasn't going to stop assembling with the brethren, but they had to put him, they had to withdraw from him. And we know that it worked because of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and following. He actually repented, Brother Kenny. And the Bible, look at first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it's amazing. So somebody had to go talk to this brother. Someone had to tell him that according to the words of the Apostle Paul and the word of God, you're not living right, brother, and you need to, you need to either get it right or you need to go. So apparently he must have gotten it right. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 11, verse number 11, here Paul is actually testing them. Why? Because they needed to reaffirm their love toward him in verse number 8 and 9. And he says, be careful, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. That particular verse is in the context because apparently there were some brethren that were probably still trying to hold it against him. No. Once a brother or a sister repents of sin, we need to come with the right language, the right communication, the right speech. And we don't look at what they have done in the past. Yes, they need to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance, but they have repented. And Brother Jason, you repented. Therefore, we don't hold it against you. God doesn't hold it against you. God is faithful and just to forgive. And because of that, your fellowship is restored. Amen. <laughs> the Bible is right. The Bible is right. So Paul told the brethren, he's a good brother now. And when we stop and think about this, we shouldn't have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But we need to expose them. In Romans chapter 1, verses 28 to 32, we know for a fact, brethren, that our speech has to align with the word of God. I've got about three minutes here. I tell you, this time goes fast up here. I tell you, Y'all need, we need to change our clock. Yeah. Throw it away. <laughs> Throw it away. In Romans chapter 1, starting at verse number 28, not going to read it for time to say, but you got all of these sins in here. Brethren, can we say this? These things that we see in this text are the very things we see today. And our speech needs to be very precise when we are engaging with brethren and those who are in them engage in these things as a lifestyle. Amen. But we better be careful not to be agreeing with them with sly speech like this. Well, I'm not going to say that I would do it, but I can't say he's wrong. I was just talking to Brother Pickcock about a preacher. He was talking about instrumental music. And he said, I don't believe that. I don't believe this. I wouldn't do it. He says, I wouldn't do it, but I can't say that he's sinning for doing it. He's a Romans 132 guy. Yeah. Even though he's not admitting. Brethren, if someone is engaging in these types of things, we cannot use the type of speech that's actually going to be the tree of life that's going to actually support it and approve of it. Can't be an approval of it. Can't be approving of that. And so we need to make sure that as the people of God, we are approving of the things that God approves of 
and that's it. We're going to end right there. We'll end right there because I think I've said what I needed to say as relates to our speech. How we deal with those who are in the world, bringing those to Christ through persuasion, but also how we are working with one another, building up one another, encouraging one another, correcting one another, being corrected, and allowing people to correct us, even though they may not say it right. But if it's right, do it. And you can deal with how they said it, said it later. But if what they're saying is true, it's true. I used to say this, and I forgot I used to say this until right now. I just thought about it. I used to say, uh, if I'm if I'm walking across the street and you see a big Mack truck coming, that's not the time for you to say, "Brother, get out of the way!" Hey, fool, get out of the way! That's what you need to be saying. But this is where we live. This is where we live. We live in a Sin like that. Yeah. Did it help you get out of sin? Yeah. Then you ought to be praising God that He said it. Amen. Amen. That's it. God bless you.